Item number, SCP-092, Object Class, Safe. Special Containment Procedures. The 3,125 instances of SCP-092 are to be held in individual cases suitable for containing non-anomalous audio compact discs, or CDs, and stored in standard inanimate object lockers at Site-37. Each instance is to be individually numbered with permanent marker. Testing of instances of SCP-092 is to be done in soundproof rooms. Only one instance of SCP-092 may be examined at a time. Only D-Class personnel are to listen to previously unexamined instances of SCP-092. Research proposals which involve non-D-Class personnel listening to instances of SCP-092 require written approval from Site Command. The cadaver of SCP-092-B is not currently considered anomalous, except by association, and is preserved in the morgue freezer at Site-19. Description SCP-092 is a set of 3,125 audio CDs, each labeled the absolute, 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 absolute best of the fifth dimension and marked with the names of the 31 performers who have at various times been part of the American singing group The Fifth Dimension. Each instance of SCP-092, when played in a standard CD player, will produce a distinct anomalous effect upon all individuals within hearing range. The anomalous phenomenon will last 74 minutes, the duration of a standard audio CD, during which time listeners will be unable to leave hearing range, or to shut off the CD player, or otherwise interrupt its function. As well, when the anomalous phenomenon finishes, all surviving listeners will engage in synchronized vocalization of the phrase, Wow, that was real cool. Synchronized vocalization has been observed in non-anglophones, pre-verbal infants, unconscious individuals, paralyzed individuals, and individuals physically incapable of speech due to laryngeal, lingual, and or buccal damage. The anomalous properties of each instance of SCP-092 are thematically and conceptually linked to the number 5, dimensions, and or the members of the 5th dimension. As of 871 instances of SCP-092 have been assessed, and their anomalous properties formally described. Representative sample of documented anomalous properties of instances of SCP-092. Instance SCP-092-28 Anomalous property. Listeners experience quintuple vision for all moving objects. Instance SCP-092-41. Anomalous property. Listeners' bodies exude pentagonal crystals of elemental boron, chemical element number 5. Crystals cease materializing upon conclusion of CD, but do not dematerialize. Instance SCP-092-42. Anomalous property. Listeners' bodies exude pentagonal ingots of elemental manganese, chemical element number 25, or 5 to the power of 2. Ingots cease materializing upon conclusion of CD, but do not dematerialize. Listeners succumb to acute manganese poisoning within 24 hours. Instance SCP-09243 Anomalous Property Listeners' bodies exude pentagonal nodules of elemental cesium, Chemical element number 55. All listeners killed by cesium burns within 8 minutes. Instance SCP-09279. Anomalous property. Listeners become physiologically 5 years old. Instance SCP-09280. Anomalous property. Listeners become physiologically 5 months old. Instance SCP-09281. Anomalous property. Listeners become physiologically five weeks old. Instance SCP-09282 Anomalous property Listeners become physiologically five days old. Instance SCP-09287 Anomalous property Listeners spontaneously become five months pregnant. Pregnancies spontaneously miscarry upon conclusion of CD. In initial tests, all male listeners succumb to massive internal hemorrhaging within 10 minutes, as do three female listeners. Surviving female listeners succumb to organ damage within four days. Postmortem genetic analysis shows that all fetuses were identical and are not related to the listeners. 
Instance, SCP-092-126. Anomalous property. Listeners experience unbearably painful facial spasms, characterized by constant chewing and biting motions. Symptoms of trigeminal neuralgia, caused by inflammation of the fifth cranial nerve. During initial test, all listeners batter themselves into unconsciousness against walls of testing chamber in attempt to escape the pain. Instance, SCP-092-175. Anomalous property. Listeners' bodies are pentasected radially, producing five disconnected segments, which remain alive and mobile. Instance SCP-092-176 Anomalous Property Listeners' bodies are pentasected laterally, producing five disconnected segments, which remain alive and mobile. Instance SCP-092-177 Anomalous Property Listeners' bodies are pentasected axially, producing five disconnected segments, which remain alive and mobile. Instance SCP-092-200 Anomalous Property Listeners are teleported to a site on the surface of Himalaya, the fifth most massive moon of Jupiter, fifth planet from the Sun. Listeners are returned upon conclusion of CD, but succumb to the combined effects of hypothermia, hypoxia, and radiation poisoning within three hours. Requests have been made to use SCP-092-200 to send exploration teams equipped with environment suits to Himalaya. Approval is pending. Instance, SCP-092-256. Anomalous property. Listeners are converted into two-dimensional forms. Instance, SCP-092-271. Anomalous property. Listeners spontaneously lose five teeth each. Teeth do not regrow after conclusion of CD. Instance, SCP-092-272 Anomalous Property Listeners spontaneously lose all but five teeth each. Teeth do not regrow after conclusion of CD. Instance SCP-092-273 Anomalous Property Listeners spontaneously lose five fingernails each. Fingernails do not regrow after conclusion of CD. Instance SCP-092-274 Anomalous Property Listeners spontaneously lose five toenails each. Toenails do not regrow after conclusion of CD. Instance SCP-092-278 Anomalous Property Listeners spontaneously grow three extra eyes each for a total of five. Extra eyes do not dematerialize upon conclusion of CD. Eyes are functional and of the same color as listeners' original eyes. D-0927714, who had lost an eye in a fight prior to entering Foundation custody, grew four extra eyes when listening to SCP-092-278. Instance, SCP-092-279, Anomalous Property. Listeners experience topological deformation, such that their height becomes the circumference of their waist, and vice versa. Deformation reverts at conclusion of CD. This appears to be an exchange between listeners' dimension of height and dimension of width. Instance, SCP-092-285. Anomalous property. Listeners sneeze five times per minute for the duration of the CD. Instance, SCP-092-286. Anomalous property. Listeners belch five times per minute for the duration of the CD. Instance, SCP-092-287, Anomalous Property, Listeners hiccup five times per minute for the duration of the CD. Instance, SCP-092-288, Anomalous Property, Listeners cough five times per minute for the duration of the CD. Instance, SCP-092-315, Anomalous Property, Listeners find themselves within the 2010 Lars von Trier film Dimension, where they are able to interact with the setting, but not affect the actions of the characters. Since Dimension is only 27 minutes in duration, the events within the film repeat 2.74 times. Instance SCP-092-316 Listeners find themselves within the 1993 East Enders Doctor Who crossover, Dimensions in Time, where they are able to interact with the setting but not affect the actions of the characters. 
Since the two parts of Dimensions in Time are only 13 minutes in total duration, the events within the episodes repeat 5.69 times. Instance, SCP-092-317, Anomalous Property. Listeners find themselves within the 1963 Italian film Amore in Quattro Dimensioni, where they are able to interact with the setting but not affect the actions of the characters. Instance, SCP-092-397, Anomalous Property. Listeners experience random moments in the life of Alan Shepard, the fifth man to walk on the moon. Instance SCP-092-399 Anomalous Property Listeners experience random moments in the life of James Monroe, the fifth president of the United States. Instance SCP-092-400 Anomalous Property Listeners experience random moments in the life of Mackenzie Bowl, the fifth prime minister of Canada. Instance SCP-092-401 Anomalous Property Listeners experience random moments in the life of Edward Sega, the fifth Prime Minister of Jamaica. Instance, SCP-092-402, Anomalous Property. Listeners experience random moments in the life of Charan Singh, the fifth Prime Minister of India. Instance, SCP-092-403, Anomalous Property. Listeners experience random moments in the life of Helen Hayes, the fifth winner of the Academy Award for Best Actress. Instance, SCP-092-466, Anomalous Property. Listeners are physically transformed into members of the original lineup of the fifth dimension, as they were at the time of the group's establishment in 1966. Instance, SCP-092-467, Anomalous Property. Listeners are physically transformed into members of the original lineup of the fifth dimension, as they were at the time of the original group's dissolution in 1975. Instance, SCP-092-468, Anomalous Property. Listeners are physically transformed into members of the original lineup of the fifth dimension, as they were at the time of the original group's reunion in 1990. Instance, SCP-092-469, Anomalous Property. Listeners are physically transformed into members of the original lineup of the fifth dimension, as they are today. Listeners who transform into Ron Townsend, 1933-2001, resume their original forms after conclusion of CD, but do not resurrect. When an instance of SCP-092 is inserted into the CD drive of a personal computer, its files can be accessed without triggering the anomalous effects. Examination of the files indicates that each CD has different content. All content is audio material by or pertaining to the fifth dimension and its individual members. In addition to all known commercially released songs, files contain live performances, practice sessions, auditions, media interviews, and personal conversations. Acquisition Log On May 5th, an unidentified man Henceforth, SCP-092-B, carrying two suitcases, approached front gate guards at Site-19 and stated that he wished to surrender himself and his anomalous creations into Foundation custody. The contents of his suitcases were confiscated and classed as SCP-092. SCP-092-B was transferred to Site-37 for interrogation. During interrogation, SCP-092-B revealed the thematic connections, five, dimensions, and the fifth dimension, between all instances of SCP-092, and then committed suicide. Transcript of statement made by SCP-092-B upon arrival at Site-19. Guard. Sir, this is private property, you can't… SCP-092-B. This is a secret foundation site, right? Guard. You can't come in here, sir. I… SCP-092-B. You're the SCP Foundation, and I'm a failure. Guard. What was that, sir? SCP-092-B. You're the SCP Foundation, and I'm a failure. I think I'm clever, but I'm not. I'm a stupid, boring, nickel turning hack who thinks that money and cheap puns can take the place of talent and inspiration. I'm tasteless. I'm dull. I'm incompetent. I have no sense of style. And the only reason I'm not an art criminal is that nothing I've ever made is even close to being art. You can secure me, and you can contain me, 
but no one can protect me. Please take me and my anomalous garbage into custody. At this point, guards summoned backup. SCP-092-B repeated this statement verbatim until he was taken into custody. Excerpt from transcript of SCP-092-B interrogation session number two. Interviewer. Yes, we understand about fiveness, thank you. That's been most helpful. But we were also wondering what you could tell us about how you made these. SCP-092-B. I just wanted to be cool, you know? I really did. I thought, well, I had my inheritance and my collection, and there was the estate and the abandoned museum, and so much of the stuff went together, and it wasn't that tough, and... Look, my ideas were better than yours. They were. I know they were. No, they're not. Nobody's impressed by this stupid, facile wordplay. It's not even good wordplay. It's kindergarten-level paranomasia. Oh, look. Five dimensions. What other things can you think of that come in fives? I'm worthless. I'm worthless. Interviewer. Better than my ideas? SCP-092-B. There's no deeper meaning to what I did. It's all just superficial Potemkin village crap pumping imitation shit into the river of human achievement. It's Stein's f***ing Oakland, and I don't even f***ing understand those f***ing illusions. I'm an uninspired wannabe. I'm boring. I'm a useless hack with no f***ing imagination. I've wasted and ruined miracles. I've squandered so much raw material that better people could have done so much with. I just... I'm not cool. I never will be. I'm really sorry about the mess. These aren't my arms. At this point, SCP-092-B seized his own head with both hands and ripped it off his neck, killing himself instantly. Item number SCP-105 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-105 is implanted with a tracking device and is currently housed at Site-17. SCP-105 is currently allowed Class 3 Restricted Socialization Privileges with approved site personnel, granted based on continued good behavior and cooperation with Foundation personnel. SCP-105's personal camera, designated SCP-105-B, is contained in a locked safe deposit box at Site-19's High Value Item Storage Facility. Standard positive action defenses, explosive, chemical, biological, and mimetic, are to be in place at all times, while SCP-105-B is within containment. SCP-105 and SCP-105-B, or any other camera, are only to be allowed to come into contact with approval of the current managing researcher. Description SCP-105, formerly known as Iris Thompson, is a female human of European descent. Records indicate that SCP-105 was born in making her years old at the time of acquisition. She has blonde hair and blue eyes, and at the time of this article, is 1.54 meters in height and 50 kilograms in weight. She does not appear to have any out-of-the-ordinary physical characteristics, and appears to be, for all intents and purposes, a normal human being in good health. SCP-105-B is a Polaroid One-Step Express camera, manufactured in 1982. SCP-105-B does not appear to have any out-of-the-ordinary physical characteristics, and appears to be, for all intents and purposes, a normal Polaroid camera, operating normally for all persons aside from SCP-105. When SCP-105 holds a photograph taken by SCP-105-B, the photograph changes from a still image to that of a real-time image of the location in question. SCP-105 is also able to reach through the photograph and manipulate objects within reach of the original point at which the photograph was taken. Persons witnessing this manipulation report seeing a disembodied female hand, determined to be that of SCP-105, reaching out from an invisible portal and carrying out the actions indicated. SCP-105-B and the photographs taken by said camera have no unusual properties when used by any other person. SCP-105 has demonstrated limited ability to manipulate objects through other photographs but can only achieve fine control using photographs taken through SCP-105-B. So far, SCP-105 has only been able to significantly advance her ability by using photographs taken by SCP-105-B. Appendix 1 Circumstances of Acquisition 
SCP-105 was brought to the Foundation's attention shortly after the murder of her boyfriend. SCP-105 claimed to have been on the phone with the victim at the time of his murder, prompting her to hurry to his side. However, telephone records did not correspond to her story, making her suspect in the murder. SCP-105 informed her lawyer that she had, in fact, witnessed the murder through a photograph she had taken with her boyfriend several days prior. The attorney in question disregarded the story and recommended that the subject plead guilty. Subject refused to do so and subsequently told her story in court, offering to demonstrate her ability. This led to Foundation contact. Subject was immediately contained by the Foundation. Foundation personnel retrieved SCP-105-B from SCP-105's home, replacing it with an identical model, and returned it to her. SCP-105's parents were informed that she was killed during the botched escape of another patient, while both were in custody of a psychiatric care facility. Appendix 2 Excerpt from Interview Log 105-08-4426 Begin Log Doctor Please give a brief personal introduction, including date and place of birth, and your name. SCP-105 Okay. My name is Iris Thompson. I was born in Phoenix, Arizona on May 12th. Doctor Good. First question. When did you become aware of your abilities? SCP-105 I'm not sure, but I think I was either 10 or 11. I remember because I was looking at a picture of the ocean and I noticed that the waves began moving. Doctor, how did your parents respond when you told them? SCP-105, they just said that I had an overactive imagination. Doctor, when did you discover that you were able to manipulate objects through a photograph? SCP-105, it first happened when I was 11, 12 maybe. My family took a trip to the Grand Canyon. I looked through the photo album after we got home and brushed my hand up against one by accident. When I did, I pushed a rock over the edge, falling into the canyon. I could actually hear it clatter on the way down. Doctor, go on. SCP-105 I became fascinated with photography after that. Most of the time, it didn't work with photographs I took, but my parents got me a Polaroid One Step Express camera. I'd been begging for them to get it since Christmas. SCP-105 starts smiling. After I got the camera, the photos got easier to interact with. Doctor, this is the camera we refer to as 105B, your personal camera. SCP-105, yes sir. Doctor, how many photos can you focus on at one time? SCP-105, I've gotten up to 10 at once with my personal camera, but I'm sure I could do more eventually. Doctor, what is your impression of your time with the Foundation so far? SCP-105 remains silent. Doctor, please do answer. We don't take offense at these things. SCP-105, it's sort of like new prison, new warden, but I know it's better than what could have happened to me. Doctor, you've been very cooperative during your time here. SCP-105, I'm a pretty well-behaved sort of person. I also like doing the experiments. Some of those things with photographs I never would have thought of. Doctor, do you know why I'm asking you these questions, Iris? SCP-105 No, sir. Doctor, we've been setting up a special program. If it goes through, you'll be occasionally allowed to leave the site and move about in the outside world. All we ask of you in return are a few favors. Are you interested? End log. Addendum 3 History of Service with Mobile Task Force Omega-7 SCP-105 was the second humanoid SCP recruited to Mobile Task Force Omega-7 under the Pandora's Box initiative. Unlike Team Able, associated with SCP-076-2, which was assigned to strike and capture operations, Team Iris had the primary mission of reconnaissance and intelligence gathering. Team Iris carried out over 20 missions in cooperation with the Bowie Commission. These missions were carried out swiftly and without incident. The first disciplinary incident involving SCP-105 involved the escalation of Team Iris missions from reconnaissance to wet work. SCP-105 violently opposed the use of her abilities to carry out assassinations, even after members of the Bowie Commission repeatedly attempted to secure her cooperation. 
During these events, SCP-105 became emotionally distressed and attempted to deceive Foundation personnel into believing that her anomalous traits had disappeared. Dr. D submitted a report recommending that SCP-105 be reclassified as neutralized, undergo amnestic treatment, and be released to the public with regular monitoring. This recommendation was denied. Following this, Dr. D aided SCP-105 in a containment breach, aiming to escape Foundation custody. This breach was unsuccessful, and SCP-105 was recontained. Investigation afterwards determined that Dr. D had intentionally encouraged SCP-105 to claim loss of anomalous abilities. SCP-105 re-demonstrated her anomalous abilities in exchange for restoration of limited privileges. Following the end of the Pandora's Box initiative, all Mobile Task Force Omega-7 teams were disbanded and SCP-105 was returned to Site-17. Because of the security risk she represents and lack of current utility, SCP-105 is presently not allowed access to SCP-105-B. All further information regarding Mobile Task Force Omega-7 is sealed by order of the Records and Information Security Administration. Director Records and Information Security Administration. Addendum 4. Special Notice Regarding Current Containment Status. Many formal and informal reports have been made regarding SCP-105 and a supposed connection to Mobile Task Force Alpha-9. These reports constitute a serious breach of security. All information regarding Mobile Task Force Alpha-9 is restricted. All information regarding current research on anomalous characteristics of SCP-105 is restricted. All reports or rumors regarding any current or recent use of SCP-105 as a Foundation asset are to be considered categorically false and should be reported to the Records and Information Security Administration. Director Records and Information Security Administration Item Number SCP-128 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-128 is to be held in a windowless containment chamber with blast-proof doors and walls and a ventilation system that maintains Class 100 clean room conditions inside. The interior of the containment chamber is to be monitored remotely by cameras welded in place with protective grating. The speakers and laser monitoring system must be similarly welded into place and protected with grating. The entry to SCP-128's containment chamber must include an antechamber with a second locked door that cannot be viewed from the chamber door. Personnel entering the test chamber for any reason must wear ballistic armor and must not bring any loose item inside the chamber. All required equipment must be rigidly mounted to the armor. Interference with the laser monitoring system or the central wheel is forbidden unless required for maintenance. In the center of the containment chamber, a wheel must be mounted to a concrete pedestal and allowed to spin freely. Should the wheel be measured to spin at less than 4,000 RPM at any time, all personnel are required to evacuate the containment chamber and foam nozzles will be deployed. Description: SCP-128 is an immaterial source of kinetic energy, which can be conferred upon any non-living solid material within line of sight of the source. The source itself is modal, with a tendency to remain along the walls or at the central wheel of the containment chamber. The line of sight is blocked by any opaque material, including lead, steel, or even single sheets of paper, but not transparent materials, such as ballistic glass. Opaque radiolucent materials will contain SCP-128's range of effect, suggesting that transmission of energy occurs at visible light wavelengths, but darkness does not prevent transmission of kinetic energy. Any loose non-living materials within line of sight of SCP-128 are at risk of anomalous propulsion to hazardous velocities. Items under 100 grams in mass have been observed to accelerate to velocities of up to 900 meters per second in a period of 0.1 second, similar in force to machine gun fire. Analysis of the mass and velocity of every object undergoing acceleration indicates that the system of affected objects contains a constant linear momentum of 2,500 kilograms a meter per second, anomalously unconstrained by direction. It is therefore advisable to have many heavier items available to the object instead of fewer, lighter items. Despite SCP-128's invisible immaterial form, it has been determined that the entity cannot be compressed into a space under a 2-centimeter radius sphere. 
Such compression with opaque materials, however, is not advised, as dust particles within the space will be excited, generating extreme heat, potentially rupturing the compression container explosively. SCP-128 arbitrarily chooses which items to accelerate, with a slight statistical preference for new objects over older ones. Despite the existence of some form of acceleration choosing, tests do not indicate an active sentience directing the choice, with one exception. The object does not accelerate living material, with its own parameters regarding what is considered living. People or robots moving of their own accord are not accelerated, nor is any part that is rigidly attached. Dead or unconscious people and animals are also not accelerated. Unmoving but conscious test subjects report a light tugging in the presence of SCP-128, which immediately stops at the first sign of movement or animal-like characteristics. Plants and fungi, alive or dead, are similarly not accelerated. Unpowered robots, however, are susceptible to acceleration. Addendum 128-1 Recovery Log SCP-128 was recovered from a private home in Reports of telekinesis and random anomalous kinetic activity had been previously confirmed by field agents, and MTF Mu-13, Ghostbusters, was called in to isolate and capture the anomaly. Control. Okay. Equipment check. Tranquilizer pistols? Mu-13 lead. All pistols loaded and checked. Control. Ballistic armor. Lead. Armor check. Mu-13 gamma. I'm not used to carrying this ordinance. Control. It's standard issue for this sort of intangible. We had to dig deep in our files. Had to look up old references. SOP on this dates back to 1968. The phenomenon was called a poltergeist back then. Delta. Poltergeist. That is old. Type 1 or 2? Control. It could be a Type 1, a telekinetic vector associated with a deceased person. But field agents said that there's considerable domestic strife in the home. It's most likely undifferentiated kinetic energy from a latent Bixby under extreme stress. Type 2. Lead. That's why containment involves the pistols. Trank all inhabitants, and it should shut down the anomaly long enough for us to figure out whose astral it is. The standard EMP tools are for containment of an autonomous intangible, should it be Type 1. Careful in there. Take no chances. Beta. Get the parabolic microphone on the house. We need to identify inhabitants. Beta. Mic online now. POI-1. How many times do I have to tell you, Brittany? Clean your f***ing room already. You're such a slob. POI-2. I did. It was spotless before I went to school. It was. Oh my god, Tyler. It was you, wasn't it, you little douche? POI-3. Nuh-uh. Why would I want to step foot in your nasty pigsty? Gamma. Considerable domestic strife, you say? Lead. Yeah. Just get in there and put them all to sleep. They could use the nap. And be careful with loose objects. Confirming three targets. Move out. Sounds of leaving the containment vehicle, approaching the house, and bashing in the door. Sound of tranquilizer pistol being fired. Delta. The sun's down. Lead. He looks young. Beta, check his vitals. Make sure the drugs aren't too much of a shock to his system. The darts are calibrated to someone at least 40 kilos. Gamma, Delta, find the father and daughter now. Footsteps through the house. Sound of tranquilizer pistol. Gamma, father's down. Reaching for a shotgun. Glad we got to him first. Lead. Good work, Gamma. Delta, find the daughter. Delta, tracked her to her bedroom. There's stuff everywhere here. Like a tornado ripped through here. Shades are pulled. She's got a pet hamster, but I don't see her. Trying the closet. Lead. Careful, Delta. That's probably the source of the poltergeist activity. Delta. Roger that. I just got hit in the face with a pillow. Lead. Quick, Gamma. Delta needs backup. Screams heard. Sound of wood splintering. Sound of tranquilizer pistol firing. Delta. Daughter is down. Repeat. Daughter is down. Chair just got thrown against the wall. Bookshelf falling over. Activity increasing. Marbles! She has marbles! Ow! Lead. We got a Type 1. Get out of the room, Delta. Damn it, just... Ow! Everybody out! Delta. Grab my hand and pull. It's... Wait. It's the hamster. It's a f***ing 
fucking tornado hamster. Tracking the hamster. Lead. Delta, no! The darts aren't calibrated. Sound of tranquilizer pistol firing. Delta. Hamster down. Why aren't you stopping? I tranked your... Sound of data expunge. Lead. Everybody out. Delta down. Close the doors. Get ready for type 1 containment. End log. Closing notes. EMP deployment for type 1 poltergeist containment functioned as expected, but failed to contain the anomaly. Mu-13 Gamma backed the MTF truck through the residence wall into the daughter's bedroom and opened the back doors. When the anomaly was observed to be inside the truck, the doors were shut and backup was called to tow the truck with accelerated debris in the armored trailer. Cover story of tornado striking the house was released. Addendum 128-2 Principal Researcher's Notes Principal Researcher Dr. Cordelia Argent Subject SCP-128 Despite what the recovery log would say, this is not a poltergeist. Poltergeists are an obsolete term anyway. This is not a spirit or a consciousness as we might think of the term. It can't pass through walls or the like. This is a source of kinetic energy. I've updated the description to show this. It's hard to say what precisely it is, but it appears to be best thought of as a whole, through which a constant momentum enters this universe. How this is accomplished is still the subject of further tests. In addition, the hamster did not have direct control over the phenomenon. If the hamster had conscious control, then the phenomenon would have ceased with its termination. Instead, if we continue the analogy of this being a hole, then the hamster was a valve covering the hole, which could have been opened or closed to allow in more or less momentum. This valve appears to have been stuck open. So all the talk about us having the ghost of a telekinetic hamster in containment should stop. It's inaccurate. Scratch notes only. Please delete. Dr. C. Argent. C. Argent. Hi, Rod. Are you there? R. Argent. Hi, Cordy. Yes, I am. Congrats on your promotion. How are things? C. Argent. Okay. But I've been put in charge of 128, and its containment is stressing me out. R. Argent. What's that? Can you send me the file? C. Argent. Yeah. Hold on. Sending SCP-128.SCP. R. Argent. Got it. So it's some kind of kinetic energy entity? Sounds like just your sort of thing, Dr. Anomalous Physics. C. Argent. Ha ha, very funny. Yes, I figured out it's a field of constant momentum without a center of mass. Essentially, you treat the momentum of the system as a scalar constant instead of a vector, independent of direction. Simple enough mathematically, but it does mean that the energy in the kinetic system is constantly fluctuating and being added to, to maintain the constant scalar momentum. It's supposed to be modulated up and down, but apparently it was under control of a hamster, and when the hamster died, the field got stuck it up. R. Argent. So what's the issue about containment? There are procedures here. C. Argent. They're ridiculous. It's basically give it toys but take them away whenever someone enters the chamber just so it can fire the researcher's clipboard through his skull. I've had to fill the room with foam pillows and send janitorial D-class in there in full battle armor just to clear the body away. The site director says that's not the first time, and I just... What am I supposed to do? R. Argent. You need a constant linear momentum without center of mass vector positioning in the containment chamber, and the controller entity of the momentum field demonstrates some familiarity with objects. C. Argent. Yes. R. Argent. It's a hamster. Give it a wheel. C. Argent. It's not a ha- That's why you're the biologist and I'm the physicist. Thank you. R. Argent. You're still the smart one with the promotion, sis. You're welcome. Item number. SCP-188. Object Class. Safe. Special Containment Procedures. As SCP-188 poses no direct threat to any Foundation assets, SCP-188 is to be contained in Storage Unit J6-455. Its presence is to be noted during the bi-weekly survey of site assets. During this time, any environmental effects exerted by SCP-188 are to be reversed. Description SCP-188 is a volume of iridium metal hosting an effect that acts on a finite region around the object. 
with the exception of the regional effect, SCP-188 is chemically and physically an otherwise unremarkable sample of iridium metal. SCP-188 has a mass of 181.43 grams and has been cast as a cylinder with a radius of 1 centimeter and a length of 2.56 centimeters. SCP-188's current cylindrical shape is not its original form, but one convenient for experimental manipulation and storage. The regional effect of SCP-188 induces changes in the environment. The changes take the form of discrete manipulations, such as scratches on surfaces or grouping and shaping of ambient material, such as dust. These changes emerge over time and are widespread over the entire region of the effect. The changes show a high degree of complexity and structure and have been seen to change with time. Further, the effect extends to all scales and has included exceptionally small and intricate structures. When initially contained by the Foundation, SCP-188 consistently induced fractal motifs. Since containment, this has increasingly shifted to include spiral and flow motifs. Biological forms have emerged as a rare but consistent theme. As the environment around it is manipulated, SCP-188's regional effect will extend outward. Testing has shown that this region will only extend outward to a volume encompassing an area of roughly 4,000 meters squared. Attempts to nullify SCP-188's effect have included placement in a Faraday cage, placement in a radiation containment device, powdering, and melting SCP-188. None of these attempts have diminished the regional effect in any way. Current proposals to vaporize SCP-188 and recondense small portions of the vapor are being explored. SCP-188 first came to the attention of a predecessor body to the Foundation in 1920 located at the rural Indiana properties of After a thorough search, the object was found as a spike partially submerged in the ground and appeared to be in the process of reshaping the local wheat crop through braiding together and flattening of stalks. No clear pattern had emerged at time of acquisition, though the effect had begun to extend over many meters. Though records are incomplete, it is known that efforts to contain the effect of the object failed. Embedding in bulk material, such as concrete or lead, did not diminish the initial size of the region the effect acted over. Further, these attempts ended with the object carving apart the containment sheath. The Foundation has evidence that more esoteric proposals were suggested, such as encasement in diamond. No evidence exists that these technologically sophisticated and resource-intensive proposals were followed up on. When this parent organization was folded into the Foundation, the object and any existing records were inherited and placed under the SCP-188 classification. When the crop circle fad emerged, efforts were taken to determine if there was a connection between the crop circle makers and the effects caused by SCP-188. Investigation showed no connection beyond the superficial, and it is the opinion of the O5s that the similarity is a coincidence. Proposals to explore or to illustrate any statistical consistency in the effect SCP-188 has upon its environment are being accepted and evaluated. At this time, due to the lack of inherent danger posed by SCP-188 in its current containment, proposals requiring extreme measures or contact with other SCPs are not encouraged. Item Number SCP-192 Object Class Safe Containment procedures have been updated as per successful move operation from Site A. Special Containment Procedures SCP-192 is safely contained within SCP-192-F. SCP-192-F is located in room 924, a standard Foundation Grade R secure room, rated for radioactive objects in Site 125A's North Wing. Room 924 must always have at least four functioning Geiger counters. An inspection of room 924's radiation proofing and the Geiger counters must be carried out fortnightly. The housing for SCP-192 must not be breached under any circumstances. Removal of any section of external casing of SCP-192-F must only be carried out during scheduled weekly maintenance by Level 2 staff under the supervision of a Level 3 assigned to this floor. 
Any breaches in the casing of SCP-192-F must be reported to Site-125A Facilities Management. Any breaches in the housing of SCP-192 must be treated as a radioactive object containment breach, as defined by Foundation and Site-125A guidelines, and a full evacuation of North Wing will be carried out by all staff. Please see Document 192-CU for cleanup and recontainment instructions, based on current object analysis. Access to the room containing SCP-192-F for testing purposes can be granted by written request to Site-125A administration staff, but will require the approval of at least one Level 3 assigned to the ninth floor. This member of staff must be present for all testing. Description SCP-192 is a vacuum X-ray tube that forms the primary component of a diagnostic X-ray machine manufactured by with diagnostic use commencing on date undisclosed. This machine was designated SCP-192-1. When an image is produced by a machine with SCP-192 inside, the area examined on the subject will be modified via unknown means to match the image eventually produced. This has the effect of introducing or removing injuries or disease from the subject in accordance with the image. SCP-192 emits a high quantity of alpha and beta radiation, exceeding recommended annual dose limits for Foundation personnel within one minute of constant exposure. These emissions are present even when SCP-192 is not being used and disconnected from any sort of power supply. This is believed to be due to the materials used in the construction of SCP-192's cathode, based on current working theories. Maintenance Update 2014 Containment of SCP-192 by SCP-192-1 is shown to not be complete. Imperfections in the manufacturing process combined with initial testing, conducted by Site A have weakened SCP-192-1's casing. A request for relocation of SCP-192 and a re-evaluation has been submitted to Regional Command. Site Update 05-2014 192M1471607220 was successfully carried out on 05 2014. All Foundation staff at Site A have been transferred to Site 125A, and Site A has been decommissioned. Site 192F, a Foundation constructed replica of SCP 192 1, was constructed at and installed at Site 125A prior to the move operation. Actual radiation doses during regular operation of SCP-192-1 were within standard safety margins, and this remains the case with SCP-192-F. The presence of SCP-192 was discovered by Dr. a covert Foundation operative tracking SCP-192. Said doctor was requested to be present during the initial examinations performed by SCP-192-1, and was the first staff member at hospital to witness its effects. Said doctor notified the Foundation, and the other three non-Foundation staff present were successfully given Class A amnestics. A research team was subsequently sent in, and the room containing SCP-192-1 was quarantined. From testing of SCP-192, the following outcomes have been noted to occur, with no consistent pattern. Any change in a subject appears to occur approximately three seconds after the X-ray image is taken. Image Result Image clear of any disease or injury. Effect Subject is fully treated with no further issues or complications. Image Result Presence of a trauma-induced fracture injury of considerable displacement. Effect Imaged bone is fractured to an identical level of displacement. These injuries always appear to have occurred within the last 24 hours, even in subjects who had been isolated before the examination. So far, SCP-192 has not produced any images where bones have perforated internal organs or penetrated the subject's skin. Image result Presence of cancerous cells within the area examined. Effect Subject will show development of a cancerous growth in this area. These tumors have never exceeded T1N0M01, but in all cases, have been malignant. Biopsies in several subjects have shown no differences between cancer caused by SCP-192 and cancer occurring naturally in humans. 
success of subsequent treatment has been dependent on the original location of the cancer. Image result. Presence of foreign body located inside the subject. Effect. Foreign body will be found within subject if further surgery is performed. The object appears to be random, but is usually a surgical tool for performing operations on the examined area. No departments within Site A have reported any odd disappearances of surgical or other medical equipment. During one test, to determine if SCP-192 could be used as a means of treatment by repeating an examination on an already examined subject, SCP-192 produced a blurry image, which had the resulting effect of data expunged, almost instantly killing subject D-19203. The personnel operating SCP-192 during this test were referred for immediate psychiatric evaluation. Item Number SCP-239 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-239 is to be kept within a one-room cell, furnished with one bed, one EKG machine, and one IV, to be filled with pentobarbital mixed with data expunged to be refilled daily. Under no circumstances is SCP-239 to be removed from her containment area at any given time. The walls of this cell are to be coated in a telekill lead alloy. Only Class II personnel are allowed any contact with SCP-239 at any time. All personnel guarding SCP-239's containment area are to be equipped with telekill headgear. SCP-148 Subject's proper name is Sigaro Stefan's daughter. Under absolutely no condition should the subject ever be awakened. Any personnel found attempting to awaken the subject will be immediately terminated. Description SCP-239 appears to be an 8-year-old girl, 1 meter in height, and 20 kilograms in weight. Subject has shoulder-length blonde hair. Upon closer inspection, the subject's eyes shimmer a gray-green shade. Subject seems to emit a previously undiscovered form of radiation, which has been named... These waves seem to be harmless in low concentrations, but in higher concentrations, they could break down matter on a subatomic level. SCP-239 seemingly has the ability to do whatever she expresses a will to do. Put simply, the subject can do anything that she truly wants to do, on a basal psychological level, as long as she is conscious. Fortunately, she only seems to be able to affect herself and her immediate surroundings. Therefore, if she can see it, she can change it. It would not be the most prudent course of action, however, to try to test how powerful she can be. She seems to be able to create and affect living matter. For example, when a D-Class personnel accidentally caused her harm, she simply wished him away. Fortunately, when the subject was made to feel guilty for what she had done, she wished him back. SCP-239's self-preservation instinct makes her virtually invincible while she is conscious. Subject's skin cannot be punctured by anything, excepting SCP-148. As a method of controlling the subject's ability, she has been told that she is a witch. This, besides improving morale greatly, makes her believe that she is unable to use her abilities outside of a pre-approved list of spells given to her by the SCP Foundation. This will hopefully prevent any and all attempted escapes. However, the subject is to be kept calm at all times to prevent any subconscious wish of harm to herself or others. Origin SCP-239 came to the attention of the Foundation very soon after her birth and Approximately three hours after subject's birth, the hospital was destroyed by an unexplained explosion. The press was informed that it was due to a gas leak. SCP teams were dispatched shortly to search the site for any abnormalities. The only living person they were able to locate was SCP-239. For the next eight years, the subject was raised under SCP care. As of 2000... Subject is to be kept in a medically induced coma until further notice. This decision was made by Data Expunged. SCP-239 is permanently contained in Site-17. Note from Dr. Dated 12-26-04 Who the hell thought it would be a good idea to tell her about Santa Claus, and then tell her it was just a story? Now we have another potential SCP to deal with, but we can't catch him 
because he is magic. Dr. A. Clef's report. My analysis of the situation has led me to the conclusion that SCP-239 is an unacceptable containment and security risk. Although several proposals have been made regarding using her for containing other SCPs, the example of SCP-953 and others must serve as a stark reminder of the risks of overestimating the Foundation's ability to control SCPs with reality-altering powers. I would therefore like to make the following proposal. A piercing implement will be constructed of SCP-148, capable of penetrating SCP-239's otherwise impenetrable skin. This tool will be used to kill SCP-239 while she is asleep, and her powers are neutralized. Because of the danger of SCP-239 awakening and resisting termination, it is my recommendation that the selected operative carry SCP-668 as well, in order to minimize complications. One of the dangers of this procedure is the possibility that SCP-239 will awaken and perceive the operative as a friend or good person, thus changing reality to match. It is for this reason that I would like to volunteer to carry out the procedure personally. A review of my personal file should indicate that my data expunged should allow me to carry out the operation, even after a reality shift of this nature. Clef. Item Number SCP-272 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-272 is to be contained in a small wooden box in a vault at Sector 25. Apart from this, no further containment is necessary, as the object is completely inert when not in use. Care is to be taken not to drop the item during transit. Description SCP-272 is an iron nail, approximately 11.5 centimeters long, resembling ancient designs. Covering every flat surface are engravings of unknown cultural origin. The engravings have been described as captivating, but scary, in a majority of staff interviewed. The nature of the object becomes apparent when it is dropped onto the shadow of an individual. The nail will bury itself exactly two-thirds of its length into the material the shadow is cast on. Following this, two effects should be noted. The person whom the shadow belongs to will not be able to remove the nail, by any means, and they are limited to movements that keep their shadow cast on the nail. The nail, however, may be removed by conventional means by anyone else, although those requested to do so reported a mild aversion, citing claims that, quote, it feels fair. The object was discovered during a routine sweep embedded into an exposed rock face near an abandoned Air Force base in Afghanistan, with a human skeleton scattered around it. It was thought to be mundane, until a researcher dropped it at their feet, and was subsequently pinned to the spot for 20 minutes before being assisted. Experiment Log 272A Test Subject 1D Class Personnel D-2721 Surface Rock face at Discovery Site Lighting Midday Sun Directly Overhead Purpose Established nature of SCP. Procedure. Subject was handed the nail and told to hammer it into his shadow at his feet. Results. Subject complies. Once the nail had reached the two-third mark, subject could not continue. Subject attempts to move away, but is unable to. Subject soon becomes fatigued and succumbs to heat stroke. Object removed. Subject given medical treatment. Conclusions. Nature of the object established. 272B Test Subject 1D Class Personnel D2722 Surface As above Lighting Night Minimal Purpose Establish effects at night Procedure Nail was dropped at subject's feet and embedded itself exactly two-thirds of the way in. Subject then asked to move 10 meters away from the nail. Results. Object embeds. Subject complies, showing no adverse effects. Subject then attempts to escape and is terminated. Object recovered. Conclusions. Subject is free to move when no shadow is cast. 272C. Test Subject. 1D Class Personnel. D2723. 
Surface, as above. Lighting, as above. Two hours before sunrise. Purpose, establish effects of lighting changes. Procedure, nail dropped as above. Subject told to walk in a straight line away from the nail. Results, object embeds. Subject shows no adverse effects. Sunrise occurs at 6.06 .06 local time. Subject is data expunged. Three cleanup teams dispatched. Subject's torso recovered 106 meters from object, showing signs of road rash and severe blunt trauma. Object recovered. Testing moved to Sector 25. Conclusions Data expunged. 272D Test Subject 1D Class Personnel D2724 Surface Concrete Floor of Test Facility 25H Lighting One standard 60 watt light bulb directly overhead. Purpose Establish lighting requirements. Procedure Nail dropped on the shadow of test subject. Subject told to walk in a straight line away from the object. Results Object embeds. Subject is free to move. Object recovered. Conclusions Insufficient lighting will cause no effect. 272E Test Subject 1D Class Personnel D2724 Surface As above Lighting One standard 1500 watt stadium light Directly overhead Purpose As above Procedure As above Results Object embeds Subject trapped Object recovered Conclusions Lighting requirements established 272F Test Subject 2D Class D2724 and D2725 Surface As above Lighting Two stadium lights Position 90 degrees apart Purpose Determine if multiple subjects can be held Procedure Subjects positioned so their shadows overlap. Object dropped onto both shadows. Subjects told to advance away from the nail. Results Object embeds. Subject D2724 continues unhindered, but reports feeling a chill. D2725 is held by the object. Object recovered. Conclusions Object cannot hold more than one subject. Potential secondary effect observed. 272G Test Subject 8D Class D2724 through D2721 Surface As above Lighting Four stadium lights Positioned in a ring around the subjects Purpose Determine the selection mechanism for which subject is held Procedure Subjects position so their shadows overlap Nail dropped onto all eight shadows. Results. Object embeds. Subject D2729 is held. 18 years of age. Caucasian. 1.8 meters. 88 kilograms. All others free to move. Reports of a scream from all subjects except D2729. All subjects except D2729 seem to shiver. Object recovered. D2729 removed from study. Experiment repeated. Subject D2726 held. 24 years of age. Hispanic. 1.6 meters. 102 kilograms. All others appear to shiver and report a scream, but remain free. Experiment repeated four additional times as per the above method. Discontinued after D2727 fell unconscious. Subject given treatment for severe hypothermia. Conclusions Emerging patterns suggest that the youngest possible subject to be held will be. Additionally, secondary effect on larger groups observed. Further research pending acquisition of a larger sample group. Addendum Subjects of equal gender distribution, ages ranging from 18 to 59, numerous physical traits represented. 272H Test Subject 1D Class D2725 Surface One outdoor field Grassy 
Lighting. Early morning sun. Approximately 9 a.m. Purpose. To determine if subject can escape by digging. Procedure. Object dropped onto subject's shadow. Subject then given a shovel and told to dig out the object. Results. Subject digs for 90 seconds, then falls over screaming. Subject expires before medical intervention could be administered. Autopsy reveals subject died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Cause indeterminate. Object recovered. Field repaired. Repeated with D2727 and 8. Results identical. Conclusions. Subjects held by SCP-272 cannot dig the nail out. Attempting to do so is invariably fatal. 272I. Test subject. None. Surface. N.A. Lighting. N.A. Purpose. To determine the object's destructibility. Procedure. 1 D-Class Personnel. D-2729 is given the object and a selection of tools and told to go to town in an attempt to destroy the object. Test area evacuated. Results. Subject selected an angle grinder, set the object in a vise, and proceeded to bring the grinder upon the object. An instant later, subject is seen writhing on the ground, clutching his temples. Audio recordings from inside the room record subject speaking in 30 seconds later, subject expires. Autopsy reveals the cause to be a cerebral hemorrhage. Examination of the object reveals some minor damage from the grinder. Conclusions Object appears to be fully destructible, but will resist actions against it with lethal force by an unknown method. Object tested to maintain its original functionality. 272J Test Subject 1 D-Class Personnel D-27210 Surface Concrete floor of test facility 25H. Lighting. One stadium light positioned on a computer-controlled track. Purpose. A. Determine the effects of rapid lighting shifts. And B. Determine if subject can be withheld from the object via restraints, barriers, etc. Procedure. Test 1. Light positioned to cast a long shadow. Nail dropped into the head of the subject's shadow. Light slowly raised. Results. Test 1. Subject dragged at a proportional rate towards the object. Subject has difficulty standing. Procedure. Test 2. As above. Light raised very rapidly. Results. Test 2. As above, but at a more rapid rate. Noted that subject was unable to remain standing and accelerated upon falling. Attributed to the decrease in shadow size relative to standing. Subject acquired minor road rash. Procedure. Test 3. As above. Subject restrained with chains attached to their feet. Chicken wire screen placed between subject and object. Results. Test 3. Data expunged. Subject expires. Object recovered. Further testing with restrained subjects prohibited. Conclusions. Subjects seem to be dragged by their shadow, at a rate required to keep it cast upon the object. Intervening obstacles appear not to impede this function, although will damage the subject, or in the case of barriers like the chicken wire. Data expunged. 272H. Test Subject. 1 D-Class Personnel. D-2724. Surface. As above. Lighting. One stadium light in a fixed position, roughly 45 degrees from horizontal. Purpose. Establish the effects of long-term containment. Procedure. D-2724 positioned central to the room. Object is dropped onto the subject's shadow. Results. Subject held. After the third day, subject becomes unresponsive to attempts to provide nourishment. After the first week, Subject heard to only speak By the eleventh day, the subject, having not eaten or drank in eight days, seemed to become agitated, rapidly shifting between mania and a comatose state. At the fourteen-day mark, the test is terminated. Object recovered. 
subject noted to be severely malnourished, but resumed speaking English once the object is removed and proceeded to recover rapidly before monthly termination. Conclusions Extended containment has yielded that the subject will survive for prolonged periods without nourishment, but will enter a degraded mental state. Addendum Partial transcript of subject D2724's manic speaking from day 14. Translated sections and curly brackets. Begin transcript. Dr. Kimiro, for the record, state your name. D2724. Ashes burn at my tongue. I cannot taste the water boils at my sight. Dr. Kimiro, can you repeat that? D2724. I cannot sleep. The screams are heard. I am not the worm the shadow steals. Dr. Kimiro. Right. How do you feel? D2724. The chains they bind. I cannot move the people. Data expunged. Dr. Kimiro. What is he saying? What is he speaking? Someone get me a translator. D2724. Growing louder. Cut my flesh to ribbons that I might be free. Subject begins clawing at his skin. Data expunged. I am the prisoner of my own foolishness. Let the crows come and... Data expunged. Let my flesh crumble like the apple whose ashes burn at my tongue. End transcript. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.